Hello and welcome to this edition of CRA TV, where we bring to you the issues, individuals, and organizations that are impacting the great state of California. So please take a moment, like and share the program. And for those of you who are watching us on YouTube or on Facebook, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. And in both cases, make sure you hit the notification button so that you can get notifications as soon as these programs go live and participate in the live chat as the program is going on. Also, would like to make sure you guys know we have an event that's coming up, and that is going to be the 2020 annual CRA convention. It's going to be taking place at the Lamplighter Inn in Visalia, California. Please take a moment and check it out. For registration questions and information, you can contact Sandy Miller at sandymiller45 at gmail.com. Also, a couple of efforts I want to make sure to alert you guys of. Uh, we are also right now in the process of supporting uh, AB 1928. This is the repeal of AB 5. Uh, we need you to take a moment, follow the link in the description of this video, and make sure your voice is heard. Make sure that your legislator knows uh, that independent contractors need to have the ability to conduct their business here in the great state of California. So I want to make sure you guys know about that. Also, finally, I uh, want to let you guys know the CRA annual the CRA list of endorsed candidates is also available now the March 3rd primary is right around the corner so we want to make sure you guys are plugged in and you guys know exactly who to support once again there'll be a link in the description of this video uh, where you can uh, find a list of all of the candidates that are supported statewide uh, here with the California Republican Assembly all right, let's get into today's topic now there's uh, only one statewide ballot initiative uh, that is going to be on the ballot this year, and it is Proposition 13. Now, I already know you're thinking Prop 13, good thing, right? No, this is not that Prop 13. It is a different Proposition 13. And because of that, we wanted to bring on the show uh, someone who could explain to you the difference between the new Prop 13 and the old Prop 13 and help you to understand why this is a measure that you need to oppose. And with that, I would like to welcome Mr. David Wolf with the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. David, welcome to the program. Wonderful, Craig. It's good to be uh, on the air with you and your listeners. Excellent, excellent. So now you're with the Howard Jarvis uh, Taxpayers Association. I'm sure that most of our viewers know about the organization, but why don't you tell us real quick about uh, Howard Jarvis and the work that you do there? Absolutely. No, I'd be happy to do that. So Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association was founded in uh, 1978 following the passage of Prop 13 uh, that year. Prop 13 does two things. It captures property taxes at 1% of the price at which you buy your home or business and then increases it by an inflation adjusted factor of no more than 2% a year. And that does not count, by the way, local bonds and parcel taxes. Those are added in separately above and beyond uh, Prop 13's 1% cap. And Prop 13 also established a two-thirds vote for any tax increases approved by the legislature, as well as special taxes, things like parcel taxes or sales taxes approved locally. So if your county has a transportation sales tax on the ballot, for instance, that requires locally a two-thirds vote to pass because of the provisions of Prop 13. Uh, Prop 13 was approved with 64 percent of the vote in 1978. And polls as recently as two years ago from pretty left-leaning polling groups uh, still show 62% approval rating all across the state in all demographics, pretty much with the exception of the San Francisco Bay Area, but that's sort of to be expected. Um, but broadly speaking, across all age demographics and geographic regions, Prop 13 remains wildly uh, successful still. Okay, you know, today we're talking about a different Prop 13. And although it does uh, somewhat have an effect on property taxes, uh, it's a very, very different animal. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the Proposition 13 or the quote unquote education uh, school construction bond? Yeah. So, uh, Craig, I do want to be clear from the outset here. This Prop 13 that voters are looking at on the March ballot has nothing to do with the Prop 13 in 1978, nor does it have anything to do with the split roll commercial property tax increase that's slated to be on the November ballot. It has absolutely nothing to do with either of those. And that's an important distinction. Thank you for pointing that out. No, you're welcome. And the reason for that, just uh, for your uh, viewers out there that might be curious, is the Secretary of State uh, recycles numbers. He gets up or she gets up to about, uh, you know, 220, 230, and then decides to start the whole process back at one. 
and that happened back in uh, 2016. And um, and as a result of that, the renumbering started at one. So it was inevitable we were going to get to Prop 13 eventually, and it just so happened to be a $15 billion school bond. So <laughs> that's why there is a Prop 13 on the ballot. We fought for years to take Prop 13 out of circulation to keep it from being used just because of the confusion that has resulted from this. And there has been rampant confusion statewide. Um, but to no avail. Uh, we haven't been able to get that through the legislature yet. So what we are dealing with here on the March ballot is Prop 13. Prop 13 is a $15 billion general obligation school bond, um, which with interest is going to cost $27 billion to pay off over the course of 35 years. Um, that amounts to about $740 million of interest payments each and every year for those 35 years. Um, which is a lot of money, and that is one of the reasons why, why we're opposed. It's important to note that the passage of this general obligation bond will not necessarily increase your property taxes. This is a state GO bond, which is paid for out of the state general fund. So uh, income taxes, sales taxes, corporate taxes is generally speaking uh, how these bonds are paid for out of the general fund. Uh, a concern I think that all voters should have is about 5% of the current state general fund goes to nothing more or less than paying off this bond debt interest every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially with a potential recession looming, we're not going to have a $222 billion general fund in future years. So more of the general fund is going to go to pay off bond debt. So we do need to ask, and we're encouraging all voters to ask, you know, is this a good use of, uh, of state tax dollars? And, um, you know, given what we've seen with, you know, school projects up and down the state and given that we just passed a $9 billion bond two years ago, you know, we're not necessarily going to say that argue uh, that, that answer is no, but we would encourage all voters to, you know, really think about before they authorize more debt. Well, you know, it, but uh, but on top of that, there's a couple of little things that are policy things that are included in this that actually make this even additionally objectionable, right? Sure. No, there are. And um, there's two other main reasons, you know, why we're opposing this bond beyond just the fact it's a big bond. And, you know, one of those is um, in, in a small part of Prop 13, they decided to increase the debt caps for local school districts. Um, so right now, school districts can issue bonds up to 1.25% of their taxable assessed valuation of all the properties in their school district. So that is, that is their cap for all the bonds that they can issue. They can get up to 1.25% and then they can continue to pass local Prop 39 bonds if they want, but they just can't issue any more debt until you know they either build more homes and expand the tax base or pay off the existing bonds to where they have additional capacity. Uh, Prop 13 would increase those de that debt cap uh, for school districts from 1.25% to 2%. Um, and I mean, we have concerns with that for a lot of reasons. No, I mean, it's worth noting that there's a bunch of school districts that won't ever exceed that cap. There's only been 50 school districts over the last 50 years that have sought an increase in their debt caps beyond 1.25%. So this is not a huge issue across the state, but to the extent that this encourages school districts to pass new Prop 39 bonds, because A, they have a bigger debt cap, so they can they can pass more bonds, but also the $15 billion Prop 13 general obligation school bond, school districts can apply for matching funds um, off that bond. But in order to uh, apply for those matching funds, they need to have an existing bond out there to be able to get those funds from. So to the extent that this encourages school districts to approve even more local Prop 39 bonds, that absolutely could increase your property taxes. So we are concerned about Prop 39. It doesn't necessarily mean it will increase your property taxes, but it puts more, uh, um, it enhances school districts' ability to authorize and approve even more debt and put that before voters. And we are concerned about that. And the final reason we're opposed to Prop 13 just broadly is there's an inclusion of a project labor agreement within the language of Prop 13. And essentially what that allows for is school districts will um, have a higher likelihood of 
uh, receiving the state matching funds from Prop 13 if they have a project labor agreement in force in their school district. And let me just explain what a project labor agreement is. In essence, all that is is um, it restricts non-union contractors from bidding on um, public works and in this case uh, school district project jobs. Um, it basically prohibits non-union contractors from bidding and engaging in that process at all. And what we found and studies have, you know, borne this out from associated builders and contractors and other entities, uh, that decrease in competition does lead to higher costs. And, you know, as a result, especially for these public projects, taxpayers don't get the biggest bang for their buck. So to the extent that this encourages school districts to put a PLA in their bonds in order to try and get state matching funds, uh, that's a concern that we have also. Right. And, and also the issue relating to uh, the, the waiving or the reduction of developer fees. One of the things that schools pay do that these folks do is they pay uh, the developers when they go to do a development, they pay fees directly to school districts that's supposed to help mitigate the cost of schools providing uh, education to the kids who are eventually going to be living in these living in these projects. Uh, what they've done with multifamily housing is in some cases, if it's within a thousand, if it's within a, a thousand, I think it's yards or feet of a, uh, of a transit hub, it's waiving the developer fees, which is going to once again increase the cost uh, to taxpayers because they're going to have to they're going to have to foot the bill for that. But also, even if it's not, it's still a, they still have a significant reduction uh, in the sure. once again in those de in those developer fees. Sure. No, and the waiving the waiving of level three developer fees, which is in you know Prop thirteen also, um, is a concern and. Um, because it does put more pressure on the bonds to uh, to build these school facility projects, and um, and so yeah, I mean that's that's obviously not a top line issue for us, Craig. But you're absolutely right in bringing it up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, well, it's basically all bonds all the time if these projects are going to get funded. Well, you know, and, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure that we discussed as a part of this is is sometimes the general conservative perspective, or people believe the conservative perspective is. Absolutely, positively, we are 100% against uh, against school bonds. We should always oppose school bonds. My position has always been that uh, this is how we've decided to fund uh, public school construction. Uh, and as such, uh, what it really comes down to is, number one, what are the funds going to be used for? Are they being used in a way that are going to construct things that are going to benefit most of the students most of the time? Uh, but also, do you fiscally are you, the entity that's asking for the bond, the particular bond issue or asking for the bond? Do you trust that they are going to be fiscally responsible with the resources that you are providing to them? Right. If yes, then then it may be a bond worth supporting. If no, which tends to be the case in many uh, urban inner city uh, Democrat controlled areas, they don't trust the entity that's issuing the bonds. Uh, then generally they wind up opposing those bonds. Right. What, I mean, what's your perspective uh, in general regarding, uh, in particular, local public school bonds? Yeah. So, I mean, Craig, let me just, I mean, start from the outset and say bonds generally, whether you're talking about education bonds or transportation bonds or what have you, are not inherently evil. But I think one of the important criteria that you need to look at with bonds is, number one, do... Uh, do bonds fund projects that will last the length of the bond? Let's just, I mean, let's take roads for an example, right? You don't want to use bond money to fill potholes because filling right. those potholes is not going to last the 30 to 35 year length of most bonds. You want to use bonds to build new road capacity in the case of our transportation argument so that when your kids pay off said bonds, they get to benefit from new road, and new highway capacity. That's what you want to use bonds for. And that's a great use of bonds. Now with education, you know, I think we can argue that most bond dollars do go for projects that will, you know, last the length of the bond. You're actually building a new gym, let's say, or a new capital infrastructure projects. Um, that will last the length of the bond. So I think for education specifically, you need to go a little bit deeper. And, um, you know, I'm on uh, the Bond Oversight Committee for San Juan Unified uh, here in Sacramento County. So, I, I mean, I get to see how they spend bonds, including the $750 million bond they passed uh, two years ago. And, you know, what I continue to drive home in those meetings is, you know, bond dollars need to go for projects that benefit the greatest numbers of students. So if you want to build a gym with 
with local Prop 39 bond dollars, I think that's great. If you want to build a new science wing, um, you know, especially to update new technology or career technical education programs, which I know is a big feature at San Juan, I think that's a great use of that money. And it's going to benefit a lot of students, including those who may not necessarily be inclined to go to college. And I think that's wonderful. But if you're using the money to build the new stadium, with you know the cool non-grass turf field and the all-weather rubber track that tends to fall to pieces after five or ten years anyway um you know you're not getting the biggest bang for your buck and even though friday nights are cool because you're watching the football game you're not benefiting the greatest numbers of students by building projects like that and those signature projects whether they're you know a theater or a football stadium um, I just I don't think that is the best use of bond dollars, and I'd really encourage voters when they look at some of these local bonds. Uh, school districts are required to list the projects that could be funded with that bond if it passes in the voter handbook. And I really, when local bonds come up, I really would encourage you know viewers to go through that project list and you know knowing that all those projects might not get funded, but just see what are the priorities of the district. And do that, does that match up with the priorities of where you think your tax dollars should be going? Um, I will say, too, there's been a lot of questions and issues with this um, from people who want to know why only four Republicans opposed uh, this Prop 13 school bond in the legislature before it made it to the ballot. And, you know, I will say I'm a little bit sympathetic to this argument. There's a lot of rural Republican legislators um, whose school districts have a very, very hard time approving Prop 39 local school bonds. The only way some of these projects can get funded in some of these rural districts is if they apply for the state matching funds through Prop 13. And there were legislators from both parties that got a ton of pressure from their local school districts basically to be like, if we don't you know, have the ability to at least get a share of this funding, um, you know, our buildings are going to continue to decline. So, um, uh, so again, I mean, I think that was sort of the genesis of why Prop 13 made it on the ballot. I mean, we are still opposed, but, you know, I think it's important to walk through all these reasons that, you know, not all bonds are created equal. I, I really do appreciate you coming on the show and providing that clarification. Uh, and providing all of that substantive information. Uh, once again, let folks know how they can uh, follow the work of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Sure. Um, so our website is just hjta.org. Um, again, hjta.org. Number of different resources on the website. My boss, John Kripal, does a weekly column, uh, which you can sign up for uh, via email. We don't bombard you with a ton of emails. Um, there's also a way to sign up to become a member of HJTA. 95% of the money we receive comes from our grassroots member donations. So we really do thrive and depend off of, uh, individual donors. And there's also information on our website, again, hjta.org, uh, regarding the points that I made today on the Prop 13 school bond, as well as, uh, threats to Prop 13 that are coming up, uh, in November. Um, so I would uh, definitely avail you uh, to go check out the website. Excellent. Uh, David, thank you so much for coming on the program. I uh, hope to have you on again soon. Uh, uh, we'll definitely have you on to talk about the split roll tax that's, that, that's uh, likely to be coming up in the fall. But uh, once again, thank you for the work that you do, and uh, thank you for coming on the program. Okay, sounds great, Craig. Thanks so much. All righty. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of CRA TV. We very much appreciate you all liking and sharing these videos and telling your friends about the California Republican Assembly. We are the conscience of the Republican Party. You guys take care. We'll talk to you again real soon.